Acer Glen version 2.0. Okay, some of you may know. We made an Acer Glen once before. We were calling it Acer Glen. Acer Glen sounds a little bit nicer, more kid friendly if you get my drift. And we used the dreaded leaves that were never be spoken of again. Notice I didn't even say what kind of leaves. You don't want to know. Don't go back and look. It's just not worth it. So instead, what we're going to do is move forward and we're going to make a better Acer Glen. Now, Paul Borda wanted me to make an Acer Glen. He's one of our viewers and he sent us this maple syrup, which is, there's the label so you can see it. This is a lot of maple syrup, okay? I wasn't expecting this and it doesn't fit in our fridge. So we have to break this down into smaller containers because it does say refrigerate after opening, which according to one of our Canadian friends, hi Kenny, he said, I have never heard of refrigerating maple syrup before. However, I grew up refrigerating maple syrup. So, well, Kenny also lives in Canada yeah. and we live in Florida. So, yeah. so refrigeration is a different aspect. There might be a thing there. <laughs> and first, I would also like to say for all of our friends in Canada, I'm sorry, this is Vermont maple syrup. For all of our friends in Vermont, thank you. This is Vermont maple syrup. Not to say the Canadian is better, worse, different, or otherwise. We don't actually know. But this was sent to us, so we're going to use it, and we're thankful for it. Also, I set up this whole recipe, put all this thought into it, and I was going to use orange blossom honey. And then I read the, the container again, and it said, wood-fired maple syrup. And I went, okay. And I opened it, and I smelled it. And when you smell it, it smells more like bochet honey or caramel yeah. than just plain old maple syrup, which is making me rethink using this kind of honey, because does orange really go with that? So... I don't know. I'm going to smell the honey, too. Well, I have a spoon. <laughs> I don't know. I think, I think those would go good together. Yeah, I, I think they could still work together. But the whole point was I want to take a taste. <laughs> I just got to do it in such a way that I'm not going to make too much of a mess. Because, you know, I, I'm prone to making messes here. It's very liquidy. Oh, my God. That is really good. <laughs> wow. You want to try some? Yeah, you, yeah, just, you, you just have a to. little bit. Just a oh, little come bit. on. Okay. Live a little. That, that is a little. It's, it's unique. Mm -hmm. It does have a little bit of a smoky thing going for it, which I think is really cool. Um, here. The smoky thing. I like that. I want to glaze some sweet potatoes with this. Did you seriously just say that you want to put maple syrup on sweet potatoes? I did. Is that wrong? Yeah, it's okay. It's not something I like to do. <laughs> we could try it. I mean, if you want to. And they're all going to be for me, apparently. No, I'll eat them. <laughs> with this on it, I'll eat them. So before we get too into this, let me explain what an Acer Glen is, okay? An Acer Glen is, is a mead that has maple syrup in it. Now, in order to be classified technically as a mead, it must contain 50% of the fermentables from honey, which means you can't have mostly maple syrup. It has to be mostly honey. Now, maple syrup runs about the same specific gravity as honey, which is 0 0.035 points of specific gravity or 0 0.035 specific gravity per pound in a gallon of must. We are making a one gallon uh, brood size today because that's what we normally do. It will be in this fermenter right here. So if I know I want to use about three pounds of fermentables, period, I'm going to say, well, if I went half, it'd be one and a half each, right? So what if I did one and three quarters honey and one and a quarter maple syrup? That way we're pretty well covered. I'm also expecting to have to add maple syrup in conditioning. Now, this is where it gets a little bit sticky. Some people will say, well, if you put more maple syrup in in the secondary phase, that makes it not a meat anymore. I'm going to argue with that a little bit because it's fermented. Now, in conditioning, just for back sweetening it, it's not being fermented. So even if I end up putting more than another half pound of maple syrup in later, it's still a meat. Well, 
Granted, all of this is technicalities oh, and naming yeah. conventions placed by... It's not like the Mead police are going to knock on your door, you know? So, yeah. it's your Mead. Make it the way you want. Exactly. But what I do want to do is get my scale going here. That is teared out, which means zeroed. And let's just make some room here so we can... So, we're going to start with the stuff. thicker of the two, which is going to be the honey. By the way... All the stuff that you see here, you even see there's some foam in here, and the there was liquid coming off of that. All these things have been sanitized in. The Red Bucket of Sanitization! Also known as Turbos, or just the bucket that holds star sand. Okay, it's just off camera, you can't really see it. It's, it's large, it's like 10 gallons or 12 gallons. And we just have a tub of star sand in there. We put everything in there, we take it out, we let it air dry. And when we're done, we dump it out because it went cloudy, which means it loses its effectiveness. That's important. Most people think that they can just keep this stuff. That worries me a little bit. I'd much rather just make up a new batch each time. It's really not that expensive when you go that way. I mean, uh, the, the large bottle of it lasts us like a year and a half. So and that's because you dilute it. So make sure that oh, you yeah. do dilute it and follow the instructions on your container. Follow the manufacturer's suggested directions. Don't be like me and not follow instructions. <laughs> okay, so I am going to tear it out again because I added the funnel. We're going to put in one and three quarter pounds of the honey. So that was one pound, 12 ounces for those using the Imperial system. I'll have a metric equivalent right in here. Now, because it pours so slow and we didn't heat it previously, I'm going to give this a minute because that funnel is full to about there with honey. So I don't want to pour maple syrup on top of there and have it flow over the sides. Um, we've had that happen before. All right. So we utilized that time and Derek got us some it feels like warm water, probably about 100 to 110 degrees, which is great water to mix with the honey and the maple syrup to help everything get flowing together. But now we're going to add our maple syrup. And if you recall, we're doing one and a quarter pounds, which is one pound, four ounces. And the metric equivalent will be right here. All right, so we have our honey and maple syrup in there. And now I have here a cup of black tea. And it's just basic black tea. It's actually um, Irish breakfast, I believe, but it doesn't really matter what kind of black tea as long as you use black tea. A lot of people want to use all these. That's pretty hot. People ask me all the time, can I use bergamot tea? Can I use this tea? Can I use that? Tea? You can. You can use any kind of tea you want. It's your mead. However, if you want to make something that resembles what we're making, you want to use just a straight up black tea because it's not really there for flavor. It's there for the tannic aspect. And a lot of people seem to misunderstand that. So, I'm also pouring it in with it being hot so that I can take some of the extra honey and whatnot off of my funnel. And you just gotta spin it around a little bit. Be careful so you don't spill it and burn yourself or, you know, get tea all over the table. That should do. One of these days we'll probably use a different kind of cup so that it's easier to pour. But we like using the city setting mode. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so at this point, we have maple syrup and honey and tea in here. Not a lot to mix up yet. I put the funnel in there, I know. Don't worry about it. And I'm going to pour some water in here. And I know somebody's going, why did you put the funnel in there? Because I'm a natural blonde, okay? That's why. Plus, I can do this. And it, in the very beginning phase, it is perfectly fine to get oxygen into this brew. It's actually a good thing. You want to do it because it helps build the colony. Okay, the yeast will build a colony by using that oxygen. Once the oxygen is depleted is when they get to work making alcohol. So a lot of people get that confused too. And I'm just going to stop talking because with the water running and stuff, you probably can't hear me anyway. But once you get to about the halfway point, get a full stopper, stick it in there. And I like to give this a really good shake. And what I mean by a good shake is really shake the bejesus out of it. By the way, what is bejesus? It's just a word. It's nothing. It doesn't mean anything. It's just you want to shake the crap out of it. Okay? Does that work better? Notice the color change. Oxygenation at work. And I do it with half full because it's a lot easier to shake up. If you try filling the whole thing, there's not a lot of oxygen in there. It makes it really, really hard to mix. Okay, now that I have it mixed up pretty good, I'm going to put in the rest of my water. 
dai farfalloni amoroso, notte giorno di tor. So, at this point, you can see I put liquid to about here. Where the shoulder starts to go up, there's a lot of foam, okay? If I go too much further than that, when this starts going, it could push it up into the airlock. It might anyway, but I want to get, it's like a balancing act. You want to get the most product you can, but you don't want to lose too much through the airlock. Uh, you know, you understand. So also right now, before I take a reading, I want to mix this up. So I'm going to get the bun again, stick it back in. And this isn't as thorough of a mixing, but you still want to get, there's a little bit Jesus in there. You know, we want to get it up. Thoroughly mixed. So now, I want to take a reading. And when I, when I say take a reading, I mean a hydrometer reading, reading the specific gravity of the must. You might be wondering why we take specific gravity readings at all. Um, the Obviously, the actual alcohol content isn't critical, but it's nice to know. But it's really more to know, like, are we overshooting what our yeast is capable of? Can we... Did we mix it properly? Are we making another mistake that we just can't tell because we didn't take a reading? There's a lot of ways that things can go kind of pear-shaped on you, so you want to make sure that you have all the help you can get. Okay, so we are using a Herculometer, which is the plastic hydrometer. We did a video on these and found that they are just as accurate as the glass one we were using all along. It's a little bit easier to read and definitely going to be harder to break. Watch for a video on just how hard they are to break coming soon. And I'm getting 1.092 from this. So that tells me that our maple syrup was probably a little bit less gravity than, say, the uh, honey was. And they do range. And that's why I said it's usually about the same. But sometimes they can be as low as 0 0.025. I've heard of some that were in the 30s and that kind of thing. So it's not super critical, but 1.092. That's pretty respectable to start. So at this point, it's a good time to start taking notes if you haven't already done so. I have a piece of paper. I have a pen. My notes. What do I put on my notes? For one, I'm going to say Acer Glen 2.0. Okay. Today's date. Today's date. Today is August 20th, 2021. I'm going to write my gravity reading at this point so I don't forget it mostly. So that's 1.092. Then I write in what I added. So for this one, it was 1.75 pounds of orange blossom honey and 1.25 pounds of maple syrup and one cup of black tea. Now, I say one cup it is a mug. That mug is probably something like 10 or 12 ounces. So it's a little bit more than a cup, like if you're using a cup as a measuring device. The actual amount is not that critical though. You can do it with a half a cup. You can do it with two cups because the tea fills up the whole space. So it's not as super critical to know exactly how much liquid, but that's important to know. Um, at this point, we just want to make sure, and it is, you want to make sure you are 110 degrees or lower. Ideally, you want to be around 90 to 100 degrees or, you know, that's really your maximum temperature. And, and that's, that's all good. Fahrenheit. Yes, that is Fahrenheit. Don't do that in Celsius. You will burn the heck out of your Acer Gwen and you will kill everything that you try to make happen. Then the next aspect that we need to add is yeast. For this, I'm going to be using 71B. Why am I using 71B? Well, because A, we know it's a proven performer. B, I know that it can handle a 1.092 gravity and then some. And C, it actually works really, really well in our exact temperature zone. Our house is generally around 79 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit. And that yes, that is with air conditioning running. This is Florida. And this yeast works really, really well in that temperature range. You may find one that works well for you. You may need to adjust recipes to make it work the most effectively for you. I'm expecting this to go pretty much dry and we'll probably end up back sweetening with more maple syrup, like I said. Also, thwack your yeast packets. It's very important. See, got to get them all out. They stick to the sides and everything. Now, once you get it in there, I just give it a little swirl to uh, break up the yeast a little bit. You don't really have to mix it so much. Just break it up. You don't even actually really have to do that. I just like to mess with things, okay? I'll just be totally honest. And then, at this point, we're going to put an airlock on this. So, yeah. Airlock. Bung. We want to seal this up. The airlock allows gases to escape. They go up. They come down. They go out. And it's already showing a positive pressure, but that's probably because I just pushed it down and it just forces a little bit of the air in there. This will sit for a couple hours, a couple days, and we'll be back to show you when it starts activating. So it's been like half an hour. It's already going. 
There's plenty of activity. And I know it could seem weird that we get that much activity so quickly. Our house is warm, 79 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit. We're using a warm liquid, not hot, but warm. It's probably around 100 to 105 degrees Fahrenheit. Those two factors alone tend to work well. Plus, our gravity is not super sky high. It's 1.092. That gives the, the yeast a lot to play with. Uh, tea does give a little tiny bit of a boost for the yeast. It's not a huge amount, but it does help a little bit. But um, I just wanted to talk about that because it can take up to three days for this to get to this point. So don't freak out. It probably means put in a little bit of warmer place and it's probably going to work just fine. Anyway, let's take a look inside see how this is going. Okay, so here's the airlock and you can see we have some bubble activity. This is completely normal and something that you're looking for because it shows that there is a gas distribution going on, which means either something is fermenting or something did ferment at one time and gas is being released. Further down, we see a collection of bubbles on the surface of our wort. Is this wort? Must. Must. I get the terms confused. Wort is for me. beer. Right. Must is for wine. Right. Since meat is well, it's closer to a wine than it is to a beer, depending on who you talk to, um, I go with must. Okay, so you see some foam, some bubbles on the surface of our must. That too is completely normal and something that you would expect to find at this stage of fermentation. Farther down, you may or may not see slight particles floating around. Those are actually the yeast particles. Uh, there was some movement earlier. It looks like they're kind of just hanging out right now. But we term that movement that you see, the lava lamp effect, it's, it's just something that we use because that's kind of what it looks like to us. But basically, because there's activity going on inside your must and gas is being released, there will be a slight bit of turbulence and that too is normal. So essentially, this looks healthy, looks good, looks like it's supposed to. This foam will probably dissipate over time. Some of it will stick to the sides of the fermenter and form what's called a Kreusen line, K-R-E-U-S-E-N. It's not a necessary thing. It's not a good thing. It's not a bad thing. It's, it's just, just a thing. A thing. Yeah. It happens sometimes. Sometimes it doesn't. Don't freak out if it doesn't and don't freak out if it does. It is basically just dried foam. Okay. Um, but this is going to go for probably a couple of weeks. I would imagine this one might take a little while. And once we start seeing a lot of airlock activity slowing down where it doesn't look like it's doing much anymore, then we'll take another reading. But you see these people over here? They're awesome. They're our VIPs. They are the backbone of what keeps our channel alive and they give us tremendous amounts of support. If you want to be one, there's a link there or in the description below. But if you like this video, look up. There's another video up there. You might like that one too. Thanks for watching.